Great day and welcome to Discussions with Indigenous Education. I'm your host, Tavis Sanders, also known as Rita Hawk. I'd like to welcome our co-host, my mother, and our co-founder, Red Silver Fox, also known as Renee Sanders. Greetings, everyone. Right. Uh, this has been a great season for us this year. We have um, pushed out a lot of information, you know, some lightweight discussions between mom and I on various topics that range um, with respect to the BIPOC communities, whether black or indigenous, right? And we also share some history here in Philadelphia that we feel like the whole population, all of the residents could learn from, could offer opportunities to get outside and engage and um, be a part of the environment. And so we definitely are interested in that community building. We wanna thank you very much for uh, continuing to watch us this season. And as we wrap this season up, we think that we have a really good conversation for you this year, right? Um, I think something that will touch on the past, but also something that will uh, touch on the present and what we might um, look towards the future on how we might be able to correct some of these errors and not forget some of the history so we don't have to relive it, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we got our notes today because uh, we wanted to make sure that we had some specific points that we talked about. But again, this is a general conversation. We wanted it to be somewhat light, right? A lot, you know, some of our subjective input, but along with a lot of facts, right? And so it's up to y'all to take those facts and then develop your own uh, educated opinion, right? And then start to share that amongst us for that larger conversation. Um, but let's talk about today, right? Today mm -hmm. is, is gonna be a two-part series, right? And so definitely we hope to see y'all next month, um, but we're gonna be discussing manifest destiny, right? And so uh, the term is a term that may not be readily known amongst the general population, although it definitely has had its influence on a large majority of our social constructs and our governmental systems, and our education system, <laughs> yes. right? The advancement of America, right? <laughs> or, you know, that, that dream, right? The American dream, right? So let's talk about manifest destiny, right? You know, and I guess, um, I guess we can just start off from, from a general perspective and uh, manifest destiny from your perspective, you know, just some of the you know, general information regarding that? Well, um, the, the biggest thing is that we have to realize that manifest destiny was a belief. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. an ideology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it was this ideology that the, uh, the Europeans came with. Now, of course, first it was the, uh, the Spaniards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and they came, and they came to um, to teach Christianity. Okay. You know, that was one of the things that was in Columbus's log, the very first log. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, to spread uh, Christianity. Um, and then when the British came, they came with that same ideology, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they also came with the ideology that uh, that for them to be successful, that this was God's approval, that they were to be successful here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so then, of course, it was God's destiny <laughs> for the Europeans and everyone to be here and for them to take over. Okay, all right, so um, the Puritans, right? We started mm -hmm. off with the Puritans and, and the Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. Before the Puritans, the Spanish, and. And so, again, this has is a lot of history involved in this process. And so uh, it's hard for you to general, generalize <laughs> the conversation, right, without giving people some background information on the subject matter. Um, but I guess uh, before we define it, right, before mm -hmm. we, we go actually go into the definition, I just wanted to just explore real quick the, the Puritan thought base because, you know, you stated that this is a belief. This is an idea that people have with respects to their dominance maybe or well no before you were say you said yeah. that they you said that they thought that if they were to survive in the new world it was a sign from God that they are the chosen ones that they're the ones that were to come over here 
and to um, to make sure that the that the land was being taken care of properly. Okay. You know. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Of course, because any if you're not Christian, then you're a savage, and uh, and you are you 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 have uh, you you don't have uh, systems in place, and you're not you're not worthy of manhood in their eyes. You know, recognizing that. The only man was the white man in their eyes. Everybody else was below them, including their women, right? And so uh, this Manifest Destiny has a huge and sig very significant... And, yeah, uh, I was even going to say that even that ideology is way before even their coming here. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you said the Spanish and then the Puritans and... Yeah, well, we we'll get into a little bit of that, you know. You know, hopefully we can get into that Saxon thing for a second, but we we jumping ahead. Um, before we actually start to share most of our opinion, right? <laughs> Let's give them some facts, right? We want to give you the facts surrounding this, and I guess the best way for us to do that is to actually define the term initially. People need to know what the definition is. Okay, well, this is just one particular definition uh, that. Uh, but again, it, it doesn't take too much. <laughs> mm -hmm. But this one is, is, is it's just the belief in the inherent superiority of white Americans, as well as the conviction that they were destined by God to conquer the territories of North America from sea to shining sea. <laughs> Interesting. And, and with that definition, if you're staying um, up on current events as far as the political world is concerned, you can see a lot of this being projected in the decisions and in the conversations and, uh, um, and you know that's happening right now in the political spectrum and I, I think that's another reason why we wanted to have this conversation you know um, so much of our society does not reflect on the past in order to take a look at what's happening right now and, and, and the, this, the, the political climate that we're in now you know, where to even find out this information is going to be even more difficult mm -hmm. because they're trying not to, uh, not to include a lot of these historical things. Uh, now, and, and the reason why we even have this is because of the things that have been left out. Mm -hmm. And now with the political climate, they even want to leave out even more. Yeah, right, right, right. Ban the banning of books, the burning of books. They're actually burning books. You know, that's amazing in 2023. And so, you know, let's give them another definition. You know, you go and you do your own research with respect to this. There's going to be various definitions. And we felt like that definition, you know, solidified it, it to the best that, that how we felt like it should be defined. Mm -hmm. But there's another definition. And it's a little bit more general, but still the same concept, right? Well, yep. Uh, yeah, I'll read it. Uh, the concept of American exceptionalism is uh, that is the belief that America occupies a special place among the countries of the world. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to include that because it 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 it, it, it showcases how man, this idea of manifest destiny isn't just a local idea that's that that's regulated to the. The, the continent or the lands of America, right? Mm -hmm. They they seem to want to project this idea of their exceptionalism on the whole world. And um, we'll get into a little bit of the, the history of that in a few minutes. And, and the well, ramifications again, that was, that was an ideology at the beginning. It's like, mm -hmm. look, all over the world, uh, maybe we just need to confine this to America right now. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know what, I'm going to... I'm um, I'm gonna break off for a second, right, and and bring up some of that Saxon information. If uh, if you remember, actually, I have it here. <laughs> okay, because I don't. <laughs> yeah, I know you did. I, I, just in case we brought it up, right? And so let's let's let me read that for. Matter of fact, why don't you you read that for the public, and then we can just talk about it real quick. Let me see. Okay, where the Saxon is. ideology. Yes. Okay. Well. Um, well, one thing is, uh, well, this is one person uh, who wrote this in 1847. Okay. Okay. And okay. he's describing the Saxon race. All right. Okay. And so it says, a Saxon race, protected by an insular position, has stamped its diligent and methodic character on the century. And when a superior race, 
with a superior idea to work and order advances, its state will be progressive. All is race. There is no other truth. Mm, mm, mm. And so, again, um, before America, right, and before um, their, the, uh, their, I would guess, say, the religious uh, uh, freedom of expression, you know, um, they already considered themselves to be above all else on this, on this world, <laughs> and that because of that, they had the right to um, uh, to enslave and, and place into servitude, conquer, and then place their system of order into existence at, in that region on those people because we're we've been ordained to do this. Right, and and what is interesting is is I would like to read this the the well this next statement here. Okay. Because um, to to me it is is showing that how they felt that it was in the blood. Mm. And so uh, this, mm. this blood quantum thing mm. <laughs> that mm. eventually came up. Mm. But it says that Saxon peoples to others and concluded that blood, not environment or accident, had led to their success. Okay, mm. so it mm. was their blood mm -hmm. that said this. England and the United States had separated their institutions but both countries were surging forward to positions of unprecedented power and prosperity. <laughs> it is now argued that the explanation lay not in the institutions, but in the innate characteristics of the race. All right. So because of who they are by blood, by birth, they are superior in their belief system and in belief structure by by virtue of this superiority, we have a right to move forward with what we do, right? And that ideology came over here initially <laughs> with mm -hmm. the up with the Puritans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and it continued. So you now have centuries and centuries. You know, so by the time 1847, by the time even that statement was written, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is over two centuries of this ideology being here and on this American soil. Being planted, <laughs> being seeded, you know what I mean, fermenting, and then, you know, recognizing the, um, I guess, I'm not going to call them distractions, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the fighting, right, that was taking place and, you know, the, the actual wars that were necessary as a part of them being able to take hold, right? And then, you know, one of the things that, we don't readily talk about, and that is the the opportunities that the indigenous populations offered them to survive because <laughs> that's what the indigenous people's way of being was and how their compassion led to a lot of their a lot of our hardship as a people even today. Well, it led to their successes though. It, led, it definitely <laughs> led to the colonial system success, right? While we're here today, right? <laughs> and so, you know, it's almost time for us to take a break. Mm -hmm. But before we take a break, I wanted to just read that definition one more time and then, you know, talk to them about some of the things that we're going to be getting into next. And so let me just read that definition one time and you'll see why in a second. The ideology that became known as Manifest Destiny included a belief in the inherent superiority of white Americans, and as well as the conviction that they are destined by God to conquer the territories of North America. And then it says, from sea to shining <laughs> sea. Like, wait a second, I thought this was a definition. The shining sea <laughs> part, isn't that subjective? <laughs> Nonetheless, this whole situation is subjective. This is a belief, it's not a fact. And this belief system was this, the, the framework, right, that they used, and I'm not going to use my words, I'm going to take their words, right? Before uh, Manifest Destiny touched on issues, right, of religion, money, race, patriotism, and morality. And so these are some of the topics that we're going to discuss coming up after the break. Um, and so please stay with us. We would like to thank our sponsors and we'll be right back with more discussions with Indigenous Education.
Welcome back to Discussions with Indigenous Education. The topic for today is Manifest Destiny. And before the break, we went into some of the areas that this uh, idea of white supremacy uh, called Manifest Destiny, right, um, touched on, which included, and I just want to make sure that I get it right, right, <laughs> um, religion, money, race, patriotism, and morality. Now, again, it touched on a whole lot of other things, but we're just going to use these four or five topics and just go over why this is really important for us today and hopefully we'll be able to use this information to better our communities as we build bridges amongst the various you know residents of our region which is philadelphia but then even larger across the the states and from sea to shining sea right well, yeah, if, you, if you don't learn if you don't learn your history you are destined to repeat it yes we do not want to repeat this part of history again no for sure and so you know i think and really it's really important for us to pay attention to that right and so Let's look at the, because of the political dynamics of our system today, of our population and of our governance, let's talk about the patriotism and the morality um, uh, spaces with respect to white supremacy or this uh, theme that they called manifest destiny. And, and, and how those, how these, this idea framed what we are working with today, right? And, and why maybe a certain segment of our population feels entitled almost <laughs> to an extent to have control over the, the, the major decision processes. Right, well, I think that we can begin with the first, maybe the first time that this, that, that this terminology was written down so that people can see <laughs> these words together. You know, seeing okay. things is a lot different than, than when you see them in print and, and as opposed to hearing things. Okay. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. uh, it's first, let me, uh, okay, now the first appearance was in 1845. Okay. Okay, and it, it was a very large editorial that was written, uh -huh. uh, and it was in the July-August edition of the United States Magazine and Democratic Review. Mm, okay, interesting. And um, and well, of course, I we didn't write down again. It was a very lengthy article. Mm -hmm. However, I just cut out the uh, the part where they used those words. Okay. And uh, so the article uh, said it demonstrated the philosophy of, and this is a quote, our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. That was the first time that it was, like I said, it was written down in words in this editorial, in this newspaper. Okay. Uh, now, of course, that wasn't the first time right. <laughs> that the terminology was used. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there are several instances of that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that it was used before that, but this is the first time that it was in print. And it really definitely outlines the thought process of what these individuals considered of themselves and their position in, able, in being able to make decisions that may be morally or ethically um, inconvenient for them, right? And, you know, individuals such as myself might even say morally bankrupt or morally incorrect from a... Uh, from certain perspectives. However, this was their, I guess, one of the ways that they could justify their actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, um, now, again, when, when, when we go over history, we always have to uh, remember the, the time frame that these things are going on, mm -hmm. uh, the dynamics that were going on during that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, because we, we cannot look at things in a 21st century lens. So we have to make sure that we put ourselves in that time frame. Okay. So that we can maybe begin to comprehend the, 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 the mindset mm -hmm. that was going on at that time. 
So um, this is what, 1845? Right, right, the right. the United States is expanding. Mm -hmm. It is nowhere near what it is today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is just barely beyond the Mississippi River. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so so they are expanding, and and they felt that they had the right now mm -hmm. to to continue to expand. Now, there were factions that did not want this to happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you had your, you know, just like with the slavery, you know, some people were for, some people were against, you know, and mm -hmm. that was one thing about that was going on in society even at that time. It's like, okay, well, if they come in, are they coming in as a free state or are they coming in as a slave state and how mm -hmm. are they coming in? And all of these dynamics were in play, you know. But what is interesting is that six months after this appeared mm -hmm. in this newspaper or this I'm sorry this magazine that now they're using it even more so in Congress <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact it, it says that there was a congressman six months later from Massachusetts okay okay now okay. again the congressman from Massachusetts yeah and he says I mean that new revelation of light <laughs> which has been designated as the right of our manifest destiny to spread over this whole continent. This, after all, is our best and strongest title. Mm, interesting, interesting. And so, you know, I would like to take those words and just break those down just for a minute because, <laughs> again, now they're using this idea of um, um, white supremacy, right, um, uh, restructured and retitled as manifest destiny to state that they have this title or this claim to spread and to move westward, right? And, you know, one will argue that it was the title that they used to claim the East Coast, but, you know, we're not talking about that right now, right? We're moving forward. <laughs> and so um, as a byproduct of uh, legal, I want to just talk about the legal ramifications of this particular idea, you know what I mean, being utilized in, in a political sense as a factual position of, of authority over any and everybody that they will come across is, uh, ha, man, what can I say <laughs> about that, right? It, and I, it, it was, so their, their title of self-proclaimed superiority is more valid than an uh, individual's uh, uh, right to uh, ownership or, or, or property uh, before, you know, that was there before them. Any indigenous well, collective? Yeah, well, uh, again, they, they did not think that the indigenous people were making good use of the land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so they felt that they could make a better use of it. <laughs> uh, one thing was that... Um, in, 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 in European and in, in British society, uh, it was about ownership of your personal land, mm -hmm. you know, and then that way you would be able to care for your land and you, you know, so having a land that was in common was something that was out of, the, out of their concept. They could not comprehend that. Right, right, right. And, and so, of course, the indigenous people are not making good use of that land because they're just letting all that land sit over there and, and, <laughs> and we could do better with it. Right, right, right. And, you know, and I want to bring that up to today, right? Recognizing that, you know, again, this has become, this is the, the framework of the decision-making process for the development of the United States. This is how they got their land. This is how they re, uh, developed and, and resourced their resources. This is how they industrialize this particular country, and this is how they were able to develop their citizenry. Right, and then they had the mindset again that what they find themselves doing, mm -hmm. that they should con they should continue doing that. Right, because they're being successful with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And 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 so having that framework as the uh, foundation of your decision-making process as far as politically and, and governmentally is concerned, 
Now, when you have issues happening 150 years later, when we have um, indigenous and Native American communities requesting no pipelines be moved through our lands, they have developed the legal standard by which they have the superior authority to be able to do that. And so I, we as an indigenous population would have to go to a law that would be superior to the United States in order to begin to argue our claim. You know, and for those individuals that, particularly for native and indigenous communities that are fighting for, you know, freedom of our lands from, you know, pipelines and other industrial issues, we have to go to international laws and use those international standards because the United States has established a standard. And the BIA and in turn uh, uh, Department of Interiors is structured on this belief system. And so you, we as an indigenous peoples have no right that would be uh, valid in their system because it, again, as far as they're concerned, their manifest destiny is to control us and to control our lands. And so our claims have no substance in their court systems. Um, and, 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 and <laughs> There's nothing for me to say to that. <laughs> and, and, and which is why it's really an important conversation to be had. And so be, before we go over the break, you know, we just want to uh, reiterate that, you know, these, these conversations, these quotes, and these things are readily available for you, any individual that are interested in searching Manifest Destiny and the history of it and how it came about. Um, but it also has a large imprint on how certain segments of our population thinks today. You know, we could go uh, MAGA, right? And, you know, I, I, and Make America Great Again is a space where they seek to regain minority control over a uh, population, right? It's, and, a, it's their belief system, that same belief. This, so Make America Great Again is a reframing of manifest destiny. And if you don't know history, then you wouldn't know that, right? And however, now that you know, when you hear it and you hear the positions and the stances politically, that these individuals take. You can go back into, you know, what we had at that time as far as representation and as far as majority progress was concerned and decide for yourself whether you want that type of system to be governing our communities again. All right, and so let us go to a small break and when we get back, we'll go into some more history of it, but also ways that they use this to uh, organize themselves as time went on. So we'll be right back with more discussions with Indigenous Education. We would like to thank our sponsors, the 215 Guys, Philly's go-to website agency for small businesses. Queens United Holistic, located in the 1000 block of Warrior Road in Drexel Hill. And while you're there, don't forget to pick up your copy of Revealing America's Dark Skin Past, Volume 1 and 2. Same hustle, same pain, same tears on 